Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. Train travel in these parts is making news lately for all the wrong reasons. Subways are choking with passengers and burdened by delays often caused by an antiquated signal system. Commuter lines face chaos as tracks at Penn Station close for repair. How delightful, then, would it be to fantasize about a five-star luxury train with coaches that look like this? There is such a train. Unfortunately, not around here. It's in China. It is a product of the design genius of two New York architects, Enos Elskop and Christopher Schultz. They had never built a train before. They had no idea what they were getting into. The tale of their high adventure, next. Welcome, Enos Elskop and Christopher Schultz to the program, and yours is such a fascinating story, and it occurs to me to ask the obvious first question, how did you get the job? How did two New York architects <laughs> wind up working for China Rail? It's an extraordinary story. I'm a big believer in chance moments, and this was one of them. Uh, I went to school in Princeton, and I made friends with my colleague who had a desk next to me. We became great friends. We left Princeton, we continued our friendship many years, and one day he called me and called us at the office and said, I have invested in an extraordinary venture, mm. a hotel train crossing China from Beijing to Lhasa. And you said, good luck with that. And I almost <laughs> said that, except I was alone in the office that day. And we talked for about 30 minutes, and he said, we just failed our design meeting with the Ministry of Rail. Failed. Failed. I need help. Mm. Can you help? I'm, the Ministry of Rail was very intent on having um, Chin a Chinese cultural flavor yeah. to the brand of this train, and the previous designers seem not to have been able to capture that. Uh, and uh, Leslie knew our work, and he knew how we worked, and we also have a, an international background having grown up in different countries. And so uh, he thought that we could capture that that particular flavor. And obviously, you guys found something very compelling about this, even though you had no experience whatsoever in designing a, a, a train. I mean, and, you know, we're not talking about the cars. We're talking about the interiors. The interiors. Well, well uh, trains are very specific uh, engineering projects, and there are lots of rules. And generally, the design is driven by the engineers. And what the project here was was to bring our knowledge, which is out of architecture right. in terms of finishes and materials, and repurpose that for the train as opposed to trying to make a train interior luxurious. Right. The challenge was therefore to make architecture and space inside what we jokingly called a sausage, <laughs> basically. Of course. It's just a tube. Yeah. And how do you make space in there? Now, I wonder if at some point after you said, yes, we'll try this, did you have any misgivings uh, because of the, there's bad, I mean, this was going to be, this is a train designed to go from China to Tibet. Correct. On the Silk Road. Uh, there's not very warm feelings between China and Tibet. Did, did that give you any misgivings at all? We, we started this project in 2006. Um, in 2005, the Chinese were beginning to really um, populate uh, Tibet, and those bad feelings were beginning to bubble up more seriously than they had before. So we did talk about it. Um, they became worse as time went on, actually, and uh, uh, there were lots of political uh, moments that were uh, not good and continue to be not good uh, for Tibet. But we we found a way to, to understand it for our purposes as really contributing development to the center part of China, which really had nothing. Mm -hmm. And so there were ideas to create special tours. Um, you would see landscapes that had never been seen before. People would have access to the steps, that giant 
slice of China that no one sees. So we, we found that as our, as our logic for uh, tamping <laughs> down the, the bad feelings that we knew were yeah. there. You, you, Christopher, you talked a moment ago about the, the specific ideas of the Ministry of Rail, and it, was it they who c called this thing the m most magnificent train? Was it? Was no, that? It was, it was actually our our friends, the the private investors. Uh, they they had wanted they had first approached the ministry wanting to do a, a, what they called a Silk Road train, but the the Chinese were building this high line, uh, the Qinghai Railway. Uh, it's the highest rail line in the world, uh, over 15,000 feet at the highest point, and they wanted this to be a showcase for that line. Right. So we should tell the it. audience that this, the idea for this was, uh, what, Beijing to Lhasa, yes. right? Yeah, along what has been known as the, the Silk Road, fair, pretty much. That would have extended further, too, but, the, but it was yeah. this particular line that, that was uh, really important to them as a showcase. And it was all uh, meant to be finished for the Olympics. So in 2008. In 2008. So there was a real clock ticking on this. Well, wow. I mean, you you took, as you said, Ian, as you took the job in 2006, and in 19 months you produced um, uh, 52 rail cars. Well, we didn't produce them. Wow. But I mean, you rail car from from the first meeting here. In fact, just around the corner at the Empire State Building in our offices all the way to the completed 52 cars took 19 months. Which I, meant really we went from pencil to the object finished in those 19 months. I, I, I know nothing about your discipline, but it strikes me as impossible to do that. And we're going to show some really interesting pictures of what you did design. But even if it was, you know, for mica and, <laughs> and, and, and plastic, I, I find it impossible to, con you know, to, to conjure with that, that in 19 months you did this. It was a very, very uh, concentrated time, and that is almost all we did. We were an office of 12 people to help us do the design, and then in China we worked with a manufacturer mm -hmm. uh, that was a joint venture with a Canadian company, Bombardier, and a Chinese company, Sifang, and they had all the manufacturing facilities and about 30 engineers that worked under us to help us make this a reality. I think I, I, think I saw on the cover of, I'll call it a brochure that you produced, uh, sl uh, you called it, or it was called a slow train that you built very fast. That's right, because it's not a high-speed train. Right. So... Yeah, I mean, that. everyone thinks of the Chinese trains as being all high speed. This is not a high speed train. In fact, the cars are, are really a 1940s model uh, of a stainless steel uh, train mm -hmm. car. Uh, each car weighs 60 tons. Uh, and what was interesting is that in that we packed all of the luxurious pieces, but behind that a tremendous amount of technology. So. There's oxygen enrichment because at those high altitudes you get altitude sickness, and so um, they increased the oxygen content of the air in the car. They carried all of their waste, so there was nothing deposited in nature. Uh, all mm -hmm. of all of the waste was was contained in the car and then offloaded at certain points. So there, there were very high tech things that, that they integrated into these um, basically old-fashioned Well, let's passes. get into the uh, impossibility of a couple of New York architects going to China and designing this train and doing it in 19 months. And it seems that maybe your first challenge beyond the language barrier was uh, to change the way the Chinese engineers worked. I was fascinated by what you told me about you know, each one kind of did an individual thing, and you guys, that, that, you saw very quickly that wasn't going to work. Explain our why. First, our first meetings, um, we needed to explain our concept because also they were used to des designing trains as an industrial design project, which is really somewhat like a subway anywhere else in the world. It's a lot of plastic, a lot of uh, uh, fiberglass, a lot of stainless steel. And we were coming with, I think you saw some images before, something completely different. And with the ambition of space making in this mm -hmm. um, uh, tunnel-like object, 
we had no way of communicating that to them. So we made a lot of drawings that were colored, that were legended, so that they could begin to understand what they had to help us produce, which for them was completely new as well. So it was a huge back and forth. And as we started to actually try to bring together our design and their engineering, they would come to us with a huge sheet of paper and a tiny little drawing on it mm. and uh, say, this is the door. Please sign it. And we realized, no, we can't sign this. We have no idea what's happening on the walls next to it, the floor, the ceiling. It's not part of an integrated... Completely right. a different method. Yeah. Yeah. Completely a different and, method of producing work. And, so. and one of the techniques that we used, because we have people we worked with here in New York on our projects. So we actually made samples of materials uh, with a, a cabinet maker we know in Brooklyn. And we would travel to China with suitcases full of these wares and put them out in front of the Chinese engineers and say, this is what we want it to look like. Now, they didn't necessarily make it the same way, and we changed out a lot of materials, and that's actually where we introduced conversations uh, with uh, the supply chain people at the factory because we had to stay within a budget. We were trying to make it look a certain way, but we had to figure out how to do that in China, and that was an, an adventure in itself. But they were always extremely positive. We, you know, we would come up with some idea for... Uh, uh, a blind in the in the sleeper car, and uh, one guy showed up uh, in our hotel lobby with a model of this thing to say, you know, is this okay? Is this okay? It was like a ten at night. Right. And um, so everyone was working flat out to get this thing done. So what happened is that little by little, they began to work as we do in architecture in a so-called sort of studio system where we all work together, we integrate all the ideas and the technology, and then we try to show all of that on paper to mm -hmm. understand what happens at every corner. And that company had never actually worked that way. And to our great pride when we finished this, they actually um, took on that methodology for the future. Well, let's look at some of the designs you came up with and and what wound up into in the cars and we'll start with the kind of the the uh, granular i don't know if that's the right word for it, but the bed frames um how difficult could it be to design a bed frame well it turns out to be quite a challenge Very we difficult. can we can see uh what you did here we had a very, very small space, and so the trip was going to take five days and uh, f about five days and four nights. So in this tiny little cabin, uh, you had to have livability. So the, you couldn't really have a bed and a chair and a sofa, so the bed structure was made to do all of that. It was a sofa, a seat, a single bed, mm -hmm. two, two twin beds or a queen bed, by moving it around. But the most difficult requirement is that they had to be bolted to the floor. Oh. And so a whole system behind that is designed on how to slip part of the uh, chair, gang it up to the bed to make an L-shaped sofa, then move it back, extend it mm. to make two twin beds, or bring them together to make a queen bed. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's it, a lot to think about the, just for a bed. Yes, this is done in, in the airline industry all the time, but the amount of money that they spend, there was a wonderful article in New Yorker a few years ago about how do you, they design uh, first-class airline you know, chairs. Right. The amount of money that goes into it and time that goes into it, we didn't have. So we really had to work with not only you know, what would solve the problem, but what the people there could actually produce. Let's look at chairs. Now, these are chairs for... Other parts, not not the suite, but you know maybe the, the dining lounge room. The dining room. Hey, beautiful lounge, yeah. chairs. These are what 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 kind of material are we looking at here? There we had a different problem. We had to fit 52 people in one dinner sitting, which would have been the maximum amount of passengers on the train. They didn't want to do two two seatings, so that meant 52 people, tables, plates, glasses, mm -hmm. everything in one car. 
Yeah. So we worked on the tables and the chairs in many, many iterations, shaving fractions of inches to gain enough space that we could have 52 people in the dining car and have it not look as if we were all very tightly together. Right. Um, so there were many, many iterations uh, to make that happen. And the chair, you'll notice, is uh, has a um, Chinese uh, uh, reference. Ming chairs especially had a very curved back like that. And then um, Nordic designers took that and made it a modern design. And we kind of bridged the two so that we would have a Chinese influence design, but not a, an obvious historical reference. Let's look at the lounge car, which is kind of um, similar. It, it, it seems similar to the dining car, but of course, without well, the tables for, for dining. Well, and this is just magnificent. What you see on the right also is that there was a possibility of folding uh, tables down because we were expecting people might rent this train for you know weddings or larger groups and might want you know, more of uh, a flexibility. Uh, but these were also used for eating uh, so as to get up to the number of, of uh, tabletops that were yeah. required. The dining table, it looks like uh, it's so beautiful. It looks like a French, looks like a, a, a setting for two in a fine French restaurant. I mean, it's... Uh, well, this, this is actually a fun image because you see the same rendering that we were just looking at before in the background, but this is when we had all of the food and beverage people in uh, to the mock-up because right. all of these spaces were actually built full scale so that we could mess around and see what was working, what wasn't working. And uh, so this was, uh, you know, a sample chair with uh, the different silverware um, and, and, uh, and china that they were intending to use uh, to see whether all of that worked. So whether it fit comfortably, whether you could have a formal setting with many glasses and, uh, and, and uh, dishes and bowls, right. mm -hmm. again, that it would look not too tightly. Let's get back to a suite. Uh, a sleeper suite, I guess it is, and there were interesting uh, dynamics going on about the desk and whether it could have a dual function and the TV cabinet. Let's look. Uh, a triple I think function, we, perhaps. A triple function. Triple well, it function. could be a bar, it could be a desk, it could be a makeup station. Um, the space is 100 square feet per uh, suite, mm -hmm. so it's not very big. No. And um, it had the bathroom in the in the back. You can see. Uh, the onyx wall that um, uh, we worked on, that's about a quarter of an inch of stone applied to aluminum honeycomb backing uh, that was made especially. Um, the wood that you see is actually American white oak. Uh, it's one of the few products that we were able to source from the United States. Let's go to the next image, which is similar, but is, is designed to show something about the TV cabinet and, and how it can be open and closed. The cabinetry on the left <clears throat> is meant to do various things, again, during the day for different aspects of your day. So in some manner, this multipurpose furniture answers to different, different activities during the day. Here we see it uh, open and extended, the flap of the top, as a desk. If we go back to the image, I don't know if we can. Yep. There we go. Um, the top opens up and it beca can become a vanity uh, with a mirror in the, you see on the top. Mm -hmm. And then the top unit um, had, the, the intent there was that you would have glasses uh, and it could function as a little bar. And again, if you close the desk down, you have a surface on which to perhaps have room service or right. a glass of champagne um, on your on your trip. This is uh, the hall. The hall. The hallway. That's yeah. one of the nicest halls I've ever seen. I, <laughs> let alone any on a train or anywhere else. The um, hall needed to take a beating, and um, because of luggage and people and the the requirements were very very tough. Um, so we were looking, and here you see it a little bit on the left. Um, we were wanting to make the hall not your usual train hall. So we wanted to use silver wallpaper to give a little bit sense of, of, 
of shine, of, of, of luxury, and we couldn't use paper uh, that was not allowed because of fire uh, code requirements were very, very stringent. So we took the idea of wallpaper and we photographed it onto aluminum panels. Mm. So the walls are actually aluminum panels, full panels that were sourced here in the United States and North Carolina, but that look like silver wallpaper. Let's go back, uh, just repeating the lounge car, I think is the next image. And I, I long, I wish we had something like this in, in this country to travel in. And uh, uh, what a relaxing and beautiful way to get from here to there that would be. Well, that was, that the, was the that's an image of the completed car, uh, the actual car. Uh, and it is an extraordinary, uh, lovely place to be. Yeah. Um, look, I, I think that, that what this train sought to be, uh, maybe we said it before, it was a rolling hotel. It, it sought to really be a five-star hotel. Um, that those kinds of trains exist in the world. You've got the Orient Express. You've got, um, you know, the, the the blue train in South Africa, for example. There are a number in India. The, so they exist, and that's what this train wanted to be like. Yeah. Um, well, a luxury. I mean, the one, uh, the Orient Express. <coughs> I mean, that's what from the 19th century. Yes, it's this all old. This is going to be a, a five-star luxury, but. It the needed, first one ever, you know, modern, b- it built needed, now. It needed to, it needed to look today, and yeah. and that was very important also to the Ministry of Rail. I want to show you guys at work. Uh, I I love this photograph, Enos, of you sitting on. Uh, I think there's blocks of stone. Right? Oh yes. What what? We was uh, that uh, selecting stone or? The, and what stone is that? The onyx. Um, here I am in the in the marble yard. We were selecting blocks, and then we would have the blocks sliced into these very thin slices that Christopher mentioned, that are quarter inch thick, and and arrange them in a way so that the onyx looked like a mandala, mm. which are sort of concentric circles, meditative um, shapes. Uh, so here I am. We went to the the southern part of China. Uh, to a yard um, to find the right blocks. And Christopher was busy too. He uh, was inside. Yeah, I didn't go on this trip. No, he didn't go. But we have Christopher inside one of the cars that's being constructed. This is... uh, This is everything behind those lovely walls. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, this is the lounge car. So um, what you saw before is what a passenger sees. But each of these cars had over 10,000 parts, separate parts, uh, in, in its construction. And you can see some of that. We weren't responsible for any of that, but mm-hmm. we had to make sure that um, what we wanted to show could also accommodate this. What lessons do you take from this experience? What lessons did you learn? My lesson was the incredible, well, first of all, the risk we took was for me a lesson. Um, we really didn't have experience in doing this, yet that day alone in the office, I said, let's just do this. <laughs> and Christopher, I was, totally Christopher into it. was was yeah. into it. Yeah. And, okay. and we started walking. Um, there's a famous Spanish poet, um, Antonio Machado, that has a beautiful poem that says, uh, Walker, there is no road to walk. You make it as you go. Mm-hmm. And And it was a little bit that that I felt. Uh, somehow we had confidence, we had designed a lot, we'd been published, uh, we knew what we were doing, uh, so we could apply all that to a completely new environment. And um, that was a big lesson, to say yes, not quite knowing what you're going to do to take that risk. And the lesson of working in China, which was just stupendous, the, the optimism, the 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 ingenuity the nothing nothing was impossible uh, everything was possible that was an amazing amazing uh, experience to have I have to uh, tell the audience sadly that the story ends badly in terms of passengers actually ri- pr- uh, uh, civilians tourists actually riding on this train. Explain why. They, I mean, you can't. It doesn't exist for tourist travel. It doesn't exist for tourist travel. It's a, it's a very sad story. Um, uh, there, uh, 
the, the real reason was the, the downturn in 2008. And the private financing that had been arranged was withdrawn. And in fact, you talked about the political situation. That's the excuse that was used by the bank to say that Tibet was too volatile and they wanted to withdraw their, their money from, from mm. uh, the project. And, and that really put us all uh, in a very difficult situation, uh, our partners looking for uh, funding, and in the end, uh, it was all taken over again by the Chinese government, and that's how it comes to be entirely owned now by them. And they didn't have the same motivation that uh, the private investors had to make it into the most magnificent train in the world and to actually. Um, be able to support a very complex uh, operation. And the Minister of Rail uh, I, I was found to be corrupt. And, yes, and well. Uh, the, but, so there are, there are, if I understand it, there are 52 beautiful train cars yes. somewhere in the Chinese rail system doing what? Do we know? Well, um, doing the trip. Uh, not, not, not. All the time. I mean, time. Uh, our our friends are constantly looking on Google Earth to see if we can see them still in the in the yard in Qingdao at, at Bombardier. And uh, last we looked, they were sitting in the yard. And but if I understand it correctly, this is not tourists or or uh, it, it's regular for folks. Government well, use. no, it's only for government. No, it government. was used several times. We know for a fact for government use. There were three train sets built. I think one of them was used. But the rest just sit, sit, doing nothing. Can you call your friends in China and say, "Send them here. We we <laughs> need something." That's a, that's a great something. idea. We that's need those. A great idea. On on the Amtrak on the Northeast Coast. We do. It's New a York to Boston. <laughs> it's it's so uh, good to have you here talking about this project. And um, uh, I'm sorry we didn't get into your ideas, your dreams for train travel in this country, but perhaps we'll do another program. Enos, Christopher, thank you so much nice for to have you here. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.